I'm Joan Lippincott from the Coalition for Networked Information, one of the organizers of the conference. And Tom, I think we're going to just get right into it, okay? Okay. In my view, and I do have views about designing libraries, maybe too many, the truly important projects are where academic libraries have been redesigned or renovated have derived great strength from the vision that underlies the design. What are the ways that the Taylor Family Digital Library reflects your fundamental vision of libraries? The first thing I'd say is that I see myself as a pragmatic visionary. Uh, I love uh, great ideas. Uh, but I also think that we have to be committed uh, to strategies that can realize those ideas. So importantly, it is to know your vision, but also to realize it. The, um, the Taylor Family Digital Library was designed to support continuing change. I had seen the rapid evolution of library services and our role and knew that whatever we decided in 2007 uh, was only going to be valid for 2007. So I've described this by saying you design for the library that you know now, you design for the library that you can imagine, and you design for the library that you cannot yet imagine. So what that means is, is that you actually have to build a fundamental infrastructure that will allow that building to evolve over time. And in the Taylor Family Digital Library, uh, we did that by having raised flooring throughout the building, even in the museum. Uh, that was an 18-inch space that allowed us to put all of the electrical and networking under the floor, and so that allows us to have uh, electrical uh, outlets at every uh, user seat in the building. And uh, we also have over 50% demountable walls. Now, uh, that doesn't mean they're easily moved. They're, they're not on wheels. Um, but uh, but it, they're not load-bearing, so that in fact, they really can be moved. And so you really could create a very different structure in this building. And I would expect that to be the case in 20 years, in uh, 2038, that in fact that the building would be um, quite different and supporting services and users in a very different way. The other thing that we uh, focused on from day one was on users, on students and scholars. And um, uh, Scott Bennett, former university librarian at Yale, had, uh, had just published a, a terrifically important study published by the Council uh, uh, for Libraries and Information Resources, CLEAR, in 2003, in which he studied the 10 years of library growth immediately before that time. And uh, what he found that in spite of the ideas that were thrown out, that in fact most of that growth had been uh, had been focused on uh, responding to collection growth. So um, I had uh, the good fortune of having a, uh, a new provost right at that point in time, uh, Alan Harrison, arrive on campus almost simultaneously with, with me in 2006. So we came here to build this building. And he had just read Scott Bennett and was totally convinced and so we were committed to making sure that collection growth never drove users mm -hmm. out of the building. And uh, in order to ensure that, we only installed space for 600,000 volumes in the building on day one with the understanding that we would never increase that. And that what was roughly two thirds of the general collection that was in the main library at that point in time would move to our high density storage facility, which we were able to build at the very same time. I will say today, um, there are fewer than 600,000 volumes in the building. 
Another focus was I had a strong belief in the convergence of knowledge and culture. So I believe that libraries, archives, museums uh, play a, uh, an integrated role in supporting uh, knowledge and understanding of artistic and scientific achievements, um, but importantly, of the human experience. And those three areas fill that role in different ways, but they actually work, are, are such a rich combination together, and that we should support that uh, to the degree we could. At that point in time, the um, University Art Museum reported to the position I hold, held, and, um, and, but it had really not at all been integrated in the library. So we actually designed the TFDL with a full functioning uh, museum in the space and uh, to offer students and scholars access to that broader cultural experience, to make the museum uh, part of the instructional and research program of the library and of the university, not just an exhibition space, but yet at the same time, because it was a public exhibition space. It uh, allowed us a new connection mm -hmm. with the larger Calgary community. Uh, and the other really important thing from day one was the focus on knowledge creation. Um, information access is ubiquitous. It was then and it's even more so today. But it's what do we do to support the use uh, of that information to create new knowledge. So we focused on technologies, we focused on collaborative spaces, uh, we focused on uh, expertise, and um, uh, we, um, we also um, decided to uh, invest in a 34.5 million pixel visualization studio, which was a very unusual decision at that point in time. But in fact, that visualization studio has actually provided um, the first blueprint for the evolution of our functional support for the way research is done today. And I, I refer to this as a, um, a new synthesis. And this is where digital content and the analytical tools that support the analysis, creation, and dissemination of new knowledge are integrately related, and that we have to consider that digital content and the analytical tools in combination. <coughs> Excuse me, and I think that many people here are so interested in bringing faculty back into the library and that visualization studio at the outset was one of the most significant things for bringing faculty literally back into the library. It was, uh, it was terribly important in and of itself because um, one, there was actually not a, a 34.5 million pixel wall anywhere else on the right. campus, but, um, but it was, um, it was particularly important for us because it brought people uh, into the library for medicine. It brought people into the library um, uh, from medieval studies. Uh, it brought um, people in from, from architecture. And, um, and it very quickly built links with our spatial and numeric data services uh, where they were beginning to teach GIS uh, to faculty and graduate students. And so that, that combination was just a, uh, it was a fervent initial mix for us, but it has uh, evolved in such a, in a way that's absolutely essential today. Thank you. Tom, one of the lessons learned that we, the organizers, along with Greg, of the Designing Libraries Conference hope to impart to all of you is that design is never complete. And we've heard that um, mentioned in a number of, our, of the presentations. So even newly opened 
libraries, meaning entirely new libraries, may need major or minor adjustments. What are some of the significant changes that have been made in the Taylor Family Digital Library since it opened? Well, there are, there are many, and um, probably some of them were uh, corrections of, uh, of thoughts that we had uh, uh, right off the bat, but the, but the major changes have been substantial, and they're, and they're particularly meaningful, and the fact that we've been able to make them is, is terribly important. Um, one of the important ones is the uh, uh, graduate research commons. So um, the building is a wonderful space for students, but graduate students felt like we had not focused on them. So we have focused on them now, and we have a space where they can actually book for a whole term, uh, both a space and a locker where they can keep, keep their materials and so forth, and only graduate students can enter the room. Um, we developed this in association with the Graduate Student Association and with the Graduate Studies faculty on campus. Uh, I heard the reference earlier to microforms. We have moved all of our microforms uh, and the equipment uh, with which it was once used um, out of the building to the uh, high density library and um, turned that area into more uh, uh, student spaces and more uh, technology spaces. Um, we have uh, created a, um, as you just heard, a virtual reality and a one-button studio space. Um, a particularly important move was that we moved the research data center, which was in an adjacent building, uh, into the library. And the research data center is a um, is an outpost for a federal program from Statistics Canada that has um, confidential information uh, about uh, the general public of, uh, of Canada. And one uh, has to go through a very um, serious vetting process to be able to use that material. But our, our open, um, Spatial Numeric Data Services had compatible information um, and, and, and it's publicly available. And what we realized was that the people who were using the uh, Statistics Canada information, there was this, this very closely interrelated uh, data that they were not using. And in the workshops that it was introduced to them, they weren't hearing about all the kinds of data, and they weren't getting the kind of um, GIS and other analytical uh, approaches. Um, and so we actually created a space in the library to move uh, them into the building immediately adjacent to spatial numeric data services, in fact, to build a much closer relationship between those important areas of, of research support. Um, we've created a, an audio-visual reformatting uh, laboratory, and as those who went out to the, uh, uh, the new uh, high-density library saw the other day, we're creating a uh, audio-visual reformatting laboratory there, but we in fact first created one in the TFDL and started our work on the audio-visual content of the Capital EMI Music Archive, which uh, I had negotiated uh, the gift from Universal Music, um, officially announced in, uh, in 2016, but which we had started in 2014. And uh, we've had a good deal of support from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, and um, the reason for that is, one, because of the nature of the collection that we hold, um, of the audio uh, materials, 13,000 files are, uh, are actual master files and production masters, not uh, replicated anywhere else. Uh, similar relationship in the, uh, in the uh, video materials. Um, 
and our libraries, our archives, and our museums are full of audiovisual material. Well, just, just our collection has 40 different formats in it. And rapidly, those formats are becoming unusable. And so the, the, um, the Mellon Foundation sees this as actually an international crisis, is, is that our repositories are full of material that is increasingly unusable by the day. So we are developing an industrial model uh, that we hope will, can be broadly replicated uh, for converting material. Um, oh gosh, we buy uh, conversion equipment on eBay all the time or wherever else we can find it uh, to move from one format to another to create a body of material that can be preserved over time and not just preserved, but actually be made broadly accessible because this material is really important. It's, a, it's, it's actually the record of the uh, last half of the 20th century. Um, in addition to that, we, uh, um, you just heard a presentation about Lab Next. Uh, Lab Next was a very explicit outcome of the, um, of the research project in identifying what today's researchers need. And um, so whether it is a perfect instance, um, and perhaps it isn't today, and hopefully we'll change it tomorrow, um, but it does respond to a vital need for multidisciplinary and interdisciplinarity uh, today, and, and those kinds of approaches to the grand challenges that society expects to see uh, addressed in our universities. Thank you. Well, I think many people here are worried about putting in high-tech facilities that may be out of date in a few years. So what strategies have you used to get the funding? Are you reallocating some of the library budget? Are you getting funding from your VP for research or your provost or uh, other places? Because uh, a lot of your work, say, with the Mellon Foundation, I don't believe supports the actual reconfiguration of facilities. I may be incorrect there. You're, you're actually absolutely correct. <laughs> uh, and uh, so um, we're very fortunate. Um, and uh, there has been a... Uh, a uh, program on campus uh, supported by the Office of the Provost, uh, which is, uh, uh, we call FAR CAR, which is uh, Facilities and uh, Classroom Improvement Fund. And so we have been able to uh, consistently apply to them for money to enhance particular areas for particularly vital purposes. And so, um, not as much as we would have wanted, but uh, about 50% of the uh, Lab Next funding uh, did come from uh, those funds. And a number of the other areas in the building have similarly benefited. Um, and then there's a, a while it hasn't uh, dealt explicitly with research capabilities, uh, but we are very fortunate that the uh, uh, that the Students Union here at the University of Calgary is actually a very wealthy organization, um, in part because uh, they support conferences <laughs> like this. Um, and uh, so they have what they call quality money. And so we have um, been able to go to them for particular enhancements, particular technology enhancements that gave more uh, support for high-end um, animation and, and, and desktop creation. Um, so we've been able to go there as well. So I think we've been fortunate and we have been oh so canny and oh so desperate uh, <laughs> all at the same time. But uh, <laughs> also, also, so visibly successful with your programs. And I think that's important too, both for people who come into the library, for people who 
participate and for the communications and outreach that you do? Well, I, I think uh, Christy Hurl's presentation gives you a good sense of, uh, of how aggressive we are in trying to uh, spread the word. And, um, and, uh, and with the changing nature of research, it's very, it's a, it's a complex environment. And, and before we started focusing on uh, the multidisciplinary research needs of today, um, I had a sense that faculty didn't come into the library from many disciplines. And in the process of our investigations, we found that, that yes, indeed, they did come into the library, um, but they mostly went to spatial and numeric data services. They went there, they drew on the expertise, they drew on the data, and, uh, and that in fact that we were essential in their work, but they did not any longer take advantage of the traditional ways in which we have supported research. And uh, so they all knew Peter Peller, who's the uh, uh, director of, uh, of that program. Um, but the traditional liaison network was really not a, a point in the new research environment um, that they were establishing those connections. So this meant a lot to you in terms of the evolving role of the research library. Um, I think it's major. Mm -hmm. uh, I, um, it's, um, I referred to a new synthesis and uh, what I, as, I, as I explained, I think that's the intersection of digital content and the analytical mm -hmm. tools and that one is not useful without the other. And um, uh, as Christy referenced and showed you the diagram of the services that, um, that, that these uh, scholars uh, found most important going forward. Um, and they were areas in which we had strengths, but some of them were being uh, envisioned to be applied in different ways. And um, uh, I had, an, uh, had a discussion with a uh, um, Brian Mormon, who's a uh, associate uh, vice president of research in the Faculty of Arts. And I was talking to him about the traditional ways that we uh, in the library had supported research. And he turned to me and it was without criticism and without sarcasm. And he just said it, he said, but we don't do research like that anymore. So that's my new mantra. And I think it should be the mantra of everyone in the room. I think some of you are, are very aware of it. So what I would say about that is, is that um, as, um, as Christy described, we're seeking to create a research platform. Uh, and research platforms are not a new concept. They're certainly in the, in the STEM areas. There are those areas where you have a set of services that can be applied in multiple uh, disciplinary focuses. And so, um, um, particularly in the neurosciences and looking at everything from um, pre-birth uh, problems to uh, issues through um, you know, schizophrenia and, and, uh, and so forth, depression, and then those that go right out into uh, uh, end of life uh, problems. And what they have created is an analytical layer that can support the research at each end of that spectrum, but by using the same functional capacity. So that's what we are trying to do from a, for a range uh, of areas. We're particularly focusing in areas where such research platforms don't exist. I mean, the great thing about libraries is that we're, we're the neutral place. 
and um, uh, we'll support all of you. And, um, and some people come to us to a greater degree because they don't have labs and that we can be their lab. Um, but we need economies of scale. We cannot respond to these researcher needs in one-offs. We need uh, really to, to create uh, this band of services. So what do I think that, how do I think that matters for research libraries uh, uh, right now? I mean, it's not, I mean, this is not tomorrow. Uh, this is right now, is um, they so need these capacities that in fact we may be the most logical place for them to receive this support. But if we don't support it, they will go elsewhere to develop it because they cannot do without it. So um, the, um, the Association of Research Libraries has, pardon me, has, um, has certainly the membership, many have recognized this. And recently we uh, created, and I was fortunate to, uh, uh, to have been uh, actively involved in the creation of new uh, criteria for research libraries in the 21st century. And these are to identify the elements uh, necessary to success. And in these new criteria, which were adopted unanimously by the membership, I mean, unanimity in ARL? I mean, where did that come from? <laughs> uh, but, but what they know is how important this is. And that in fact, that libraries new, need a new role in the research ecosystem. And so several of the criteria specifically address the development of that new role. So what will happen if we don't? Our importance in that, we will be great learning spaces, but in fact the very same thing that those researchers need, our undergraduates are needing also. Mm -hmm. People are learning GIS at 19 years old. And, um, and they're and they're learning VR at nine. Um, so um, so we're just behind the line. And um, so if we do not develop in this way, our role in academic research will decline, and our importance to our universities will be significantly diminished. So I am curious, what's your prediction? A percentage, a yes or no? Where, where do you think things are heading broadly? I think it's great that ARL defined this set of characteristics because it doesn't matter if you're uh, in the organization or wanting to be or, or just not uh, at all part of ARL. You can still use those same criteria as guideposts for where you want your library to be headed. But realistically speaking, do you want to venture a, a guess for where things are heading? Well, first I want to, to agree with you that this is not about ARL mm -hmm. libraries. This is, um, uh, this is all about all libraries, but particularly in, in academia. Mm -hmm. And uh, where research is, is, uh, is a vital function. Um, I, I think we're um, significantly behind. Um, this change has been going on for some time. Um, it's not that we haven't recognized it. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, but what's happened in research is, is with the turn to societal, societal grand challenges, mm -hmm. this kind of multidisciplinary research. Um, uh, Suzanne Goopy, mm -hmm. who spoke yesterday afternoon. Okay, she's a cultural anthropologist. Um, she's in the faculty of nursing. 
She's in the community health program, which is over in medicine. And she's producing results that are about changing the protocols and the bus transportation routes of the city of Calgary. You know, so this is where we are today. I mean, this is what we all should be embracing. And this is just the, this is the, this is what's happening and it's happening rapidly. And so a, um, you know, so an English professor and a computer scientist are uh, involved in a common uh, analysis of, um, of 150 years of science fiction literature. That's an everyday project today, you know? Um, so um, if I look at proportionally how fast are we progressing, it's, it's, it's not tremendous. But on the other hand, we are getting it. But when I talk about our getting it, and your question about money um, really speaks to this. And I, I had a, um, a conversation with, uh, with our colleague, uh, uh, Greg Raschke, uh, from North Carolina State about the way we look at our collections budget. Uh, as a budget to um, purchase and license content irrespective of the analytical tools that will be essential to use that content. Irrespective of the fact that over 50% of the material that people use is not what we purchase, is not what we license. And we have not embraced that world in thinking about how we manage our libraries. And if we don't do that, in spite of how damn smart we are, <laughs> um, we, won't, um, we won't be able to achieve at a fast enough rate. And the nature of research will have changed again in five years. So, uh, we'll, we'll be a generation behind. Thank you. Tom, for my final questions, uh, most of you will probably not be aware that many years ago, Tom and I were colleagues at Cornell University Libraries, and your role at that time, which was a long time ago, was in special collections and archives. I find it fascinating that the span of what you've accomplished in your career is so much wider than that specialty. And I think our audience would be very interested in your role in documenting underrepresented groups and in making special collections and archives a signature program of the 21st Century Library. Can you tell us a little bit about that, please? I'd love to. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, I do think that as, as a great deal of, of the information that we have managed in the past um, becomes ubiquitous and that the collective collection and shared print and so forth, how to hide trust and so forth, um, provides us access um, to a wealth of uh, general collection materials. Uh, at the same time, rare and unique holdings uh, are taking on a larger and larger importance and in a, in, a, um, in a very different way than some of those reading rooms that we heard described earlier this morning. Um, and, uh, and that they're just terrifically compelling uh, in instruction and research. Um, I, uh, I, I mentioned yesterday to some of the people touring the library um, about our numismatics collection, which is, is a very strong collection that's actually in our um, art museum, but it, but it could be in our special collections. And uh, it's such a powerful teaching tool. So if you can put in the hand of a student um, a coin with the head of Cleopatra on it that was actually stamped 
um, by uh, the Roman army when Mark Anthony was in North Africa. What a view of, of, of society. What, how does that move a student from what happened on Facebook yesterday to all the Facebooks of history? It, it just introduces a, a tremendous impact on, on the mind that goes forward. So that's what uh, teaching uh, and research with uh, special collections can do. But it also has a tremendous societal role. So um, in the late 1980s at uh, Cornell University, I was uh, responsible for uh, leading the initiation of the Human Sexuality Collection. And the Human Sexuality Collection was the first focused effort by any um, academic institution in the US, certainly by any of the larger universities, to focus on documenting the social and political life of, of uh, gay and lesbian individuals. And um, uh, what I had seen over the years was how both our collecting and the way we described and promoted the material had marginalized women, had marginalized African Americans, had marginalized indigenous peoples, and we were going right on with that. Uh, and that in fact we had to change course and that this was an opportunity to in fact broaden uh, the, uh, the evidence uh, and the record of a substantial uh, component of society. And, um, and so when we did this, no one else had done it. Um, it drew a lot of attention. Um, it, um, um, it got, 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 got a lot of attention. Uh, it's the only time in my uh, life that I received uh, personal threats for my professional practice uh, coming through the mail. Um, fortunately, it was real mail, not uh, email. Uh, gosh, would I have hated that. Um, um, but it, this was also right at the time that the AIDS epidemic hit. And... Um, and it proved to be so important, and I'm going to tell uh, one story, if I can, can get through it, um, of a man uh, from North Carolina uh, who had grown up in a rural area of North Carolina, uh, had gone to uh, uh, New York City as a uh, financial uh, officer, a stockbroker, and, um, and um, also became very active in the arts community in New York City. Um, his finance, his firm uh, fired him uh, when they uh, became aware that he was a gay man. Um, and uh, he uh, contracted AIDS. And he had to return to his home in, in North Carolina. And after hearing about our collection, uh, he had a tremendous collection of art and records of his own experience uh, as being how he was treated with AIDS, and, uh, which was horrifying in and of itself, uh, in the medical environment. Um, and um, so he contacted me, and uh, I had newly hired a curator for the collection, and we flew down to... Um, probably to Raleigh, uh, we rented a car and we drove out into the countryside and we went to, um, went to their home and, and he and his, uh, his sister was taking care of him and he had been living in a separate building on the property and uh, so we went out to there where his collection was and his sister and I carried him over our shoulders uh, uh, there and we and we picked up the material and we boxed it up and we hauled it to the plane and we flew it back to Ithaca, New York. And 
and we contacted um, his sister on um, Monday of the next week. And, um, and she told us that, um, that he had died and that he had stayed alive long enough for us to get his collection. So that's what the archival mm -hmm. role can mean to individuals, but it is so powerful in the larger society. Um, and um, obviously has changed so much research and, and contributed to uh, uh, you know, the, the elements of society today. At the same time, uh, after coming here, I, um, I have uh, became a founding on, member on behalf of the uh, University of Calgary, uh, of the um, Board of the Military Museums, which is located uh, near downtown along Crowchild Trail. It's one of the two military history museums in Canada. And uh, the University of Calgary has a library and an archives there. And I was fortunate to be able to raise private money to actually establish uh, an exhibition gallery there as well. And um, so that collection is one of the great research collections, not just for military history, but for political history and social history. But what we chose to approach in terms of documentation was a holistic approach. So the impact of warfare on society, and not just the uh, formal military experience, but in fact, how has that impacted society? How has that impacted civilian populations? Looking at the effect of terrorism, looking at the effect of, of internal civil wars, and, um, and created such a rich experience for the public and for researchers and for students um, to, uh, to be able um, to understand um, the role of the military history uh, of our society. And um, this is not political. This is professional. This is how we should be filling our professional role is by creating the records of important elements of society that might not be well documented or well understood or incorporated into the educational and research environment. And at the same time that we think about particular parts of society, we need to look at those parts of society that are oh so obvious, but because they're oh so obvious, we may not be uh, we, not, we may not be pursuing them. And uh, that's the way I see uh, the uh, gift by Universal uh, Music Canada of the Capital EMI collection to the University of Calgary. So this is a collection that is a miracle that it exists. Uh, from 1949 to 2012, EMI became the major uh, music industry giant worldwide, and, um, and this collection was managed to survive through those years, through all the transitions in the music industry, through all the artists, through all the AR people, through all the concerts, um, through the business operations, which were largely hidden. Um, and, uh, and so a collection of 5,500 boxes, over two million items, um, as I've mentioned, over uh, 40,000 audio and visual uh, and video tapes. Um, the record Canadian artists like uh, Anne Murray and uh, Tom Cochran, uh, but also the original DAT tapes from the BBC sessions of the Beatles. Uh, the original disc from which uh, the Rubber Soul vinyl albums were pressed. Um, an album by David Bowie, which was actually created in uh, Quebec um, at a studio there that uh, was never broadly uh, distributed. So uh, 
really remarkable material, but it's, it's part of the culture, it's part of the social, it's part of the political, it's part of the industrial, it's part of, uh, of, the, of gender roles, it's part of uh, fashion. Uh, I would say that most of the people in the room have had some experience of the last half of the 20th century. Uh, what was more important across this spectrum of time than popular music? So what does it tell us about our society and about the impact of popular music worldwide? So we also need to seize those opportunities to um, document and provide understanding and accessibility um, for materials that are the u ubiquitous aspects of society. And once again, in developing the new criteria for ARL, this societal role is formally recognized for the first time. Uh, yet, in fact, historically, libraries, archives, and museums have played this role over century after century after century in preserving, uh, whenever possible, the, um, the record of diverse societies. And I'll tell you from a personal point of view, to have been able to enrich my uh, career by involvement in playing this important societal role is just, uh, has been wonderful. I love it. Well, at the beginning of the interview, I talked about the importance of a vision for today's library. You've just heard such a vision and the breadth of Tom's vision, his commitment to the 21st century libraries are truly remarkable. Thank you, Tom. Thank you.